Okay, we are now broadcasting to everyone who is watching us in the comfort of their own quarantined or non-quarantined spaces. Uh, these are the winners, well, some of the winners of the Forward Young Writers Contest. We uh, sent a, what? We sent notes out and flyers out welcoming people who were in middle school or high school to write about what freedom meant to them in this time. It's, it's kind of funny because the uh, contest started as just kind of a throwback to something the Forward used to do many, many years ago. We wanted to know what freedom looked like, but when we had started planning this contest, there was no e epidemic, there was no curfew. And this, as we learned, turned on a very, very different meaning as we went along. So. Uh, we received hundreds of entries from multiple continents, and these are some of the people who won the competition. I am going to ask them, as we begin, to introduce themselves, and they will give their names, and then I'll give a little brief uh, introduction, and then we will hear from some of the writers reading from their work, and then we'll get into a little bit of conversation about what it's like to be 11 or 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 in this very, very strange time. So let's start uh, introductions with Julie. Julie, can you tell us how old you are and where you come from? Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Levy. I'm 18 years old. I go to the Spence School in New York City. And in the fall, I'll be attending Princeton University. Thanks, Julie. And next we have Marika Campbell-Blue. Marika, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you come from? Um, yeah, my name is Marika Campbell Blue. I'm 15 and I go to Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring, Maryland. Thanks, Marika. Now let's move on to Rachel. Um, Rachel, where are you joining us from? And tell us about something about yourself. Hi, I'm Rachel Ezraelov. I'm 13 years old and I go to Eastern Middle School in Silver Spring, Maryland. And joining us from another coast, we have Lainey. Lainey, can you tell us something? Hi, yourself? I'm Lainey Slossinger. I'm 17, and I go to Burlingame High School in Burlingame, California. Thanks, Lainey. And Josh, joining us, our one representative here from the Midwest. Uh, tell us where you are right now, Josh. Hi, my name is Josh Elkin. I'm 16 years old, and I attend the High School of Health Sciences in Wales, Wisconsin. And Victoria in the very, very white room, can you tell us where you are and what you're doing? Um, hi, I'm Victoria Neely. I'm 13 and I go to the Brandeis School of San Francisco. Thanks, Victoria. We may or may not have another person joining us, um, Lily Foreman, who is a 17-year-old student at Columbia High School in South Orange, New Jersey. Uh, unfortunately, like many people sh who you know attend school right now, she had a class up until the very last moment. So she may or may not be joining us. If not, you know, we are glad that all of you are here. I'm going to start by reading something. Um, I want to hear everybody read, but I wanted to start by reading something. If you'll notice the background behind me, I'm sitting right now in uh, my daughter's bedroom because our other rooms are occupied right now. So I put up a little uh, background, which is what the forward used to look like back more than 120 years ago on the Lower East Side. So behind me uh, is the Forward Building. Forward has a very, very illustrious history. And I'm gonna read something briefly from that illustrious history. It goes like this. I remember that magical day in my life when everything was clear and simple. A chair was a chair, a horse was a horse, and all the people in the world were then divided into two classes, Jews and Gentiles. I knew no, no other classification, but then fell a shaft of light. I remember the day when a stranger from some faraway land came to our town. Upon my persistent tugging of Mother Skirt and obstinate questioning as to what he is, I received the plot reply, he is an American. Are Americans Jews? I asked promptly, hoping they were a special kind of Jews, the 10 lost tribes perhaps. No, I was told, Americans are not Jews. No, but he spoke Yiddish, wore his hat at meals, and behaved altogether like an ordinary Jew. So more tugging at my mother's skirt and more questioning, and then I found out that our stranger was really a Jew. 
He's an American Jew, I was told. On that day, my carefree youth ended. That was a piece written from a much larger piece by Benjamin Bredensky on November 1st, 1931, and he was one of the first ever winners of a forward youth writing contest nearly 100 years ago. Many, many years later, Benjamin Bredinsky actually wound up writing for the foreword as well, and she is an author and professor. So I guess what I'm trying to establish by reading that is that the people who are here, the people who entered and won our contest from hundreds of entries from multiple continents are part of a very, very illustrious group. They are very talented group, very thoughtful, and like, you know, uh, this gentleman, Benjamin, back in 1931, they may be at the beginning of not only a great career, but also uh, a great history, and there's a great continuity. So who knows, maybe 100 years from now, we will be reading from any number of the essays and poems and stories that our young entrants provided. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to thank, if they're out there, a number of people helped us in putting this together. This was the product of the work of the Forward and the Jewish Education Project, and as well, BBYO. And we had judges, Dahlia Lithwick of Slate, and Dan Epstein, former US ambassador to Israel, as well as Nicole Fine and Hillary Garden Swartz from uh, the Jewish Education Project, as well as Jody Redoran, who is the editor in chief of the Forward, all of whom weighed in and told us, in so many words, that these were the most impressive of a very impressive group. So enough from me, I wanna hear from you, I wanna hear from our writers. So the first person I'm gonna to ask to um, read from their work is Julie Levy. And Julie who will be attending um, Princeton in the fall and had an interesting experience this Passover. Julie, could you read us a little bit? Absolutely. The smell of albondigas, Sephardic meatballs with peas and artichoke hearts, diffuses through our kitchen, but not through our home, as it usually does. This year, the single pot my mother is cooking will suffice. One pot will feed six with leftovers for tomorrow's lunch. Four pots feed 18 people, leaving a few Tupperwares to freeze. I sit at my computer practicing Hallel and screen sharing my homemade Haggadah over Zoom to no one. I place all of my trust in the Wi-Fi icon in the top right corner of my screen. On Zoom, there is no thrill of racing to the door the first time you hear the doorbell, of predicting which guests will arrive too early and which guests too late. No, Instead, we watch small boxes appear on the monitor as I scan the table, verifying that everything is in order. The count? 41 boxes, 41 families. The largest Seder I have ever been to. The only Seder I have ever led. In each box, I see lips that move along with mine. Silent participants who give voice to an ancient narrative. And I wonder, is this freedom? This is freedom. It is freedom because we share rituals and words and stories. It is freedom because we read each other's lips and smiles and tears and we feel empathy. It is freedom because when the walls of 41 boxes connect, they break. Then many emotional prisons become one supportive sanctuary. It is freedom because the prayers and songs and love that have kept us together since the parting of the Red Sea, since the Exodus, bind us still. Thanks, Julie. That's really lovely reading. And you can see, even if you didn't already know what the theme of our contest was this year, which was, what does freedom mean now? It meant something perhaps very different before we were, you know, leading Zoom sessions during Seders or Passover. Um, I'm going to next take us to uh, Marika Campbell-Blue from Silver Spring, Maryland. And can you read a little bit of the essay, the winning essay that you wrote? Um, these last couple of weeks during the quarantine, I've seen and heard an endless amount of complaints about people not being able to leave their houses and having to cancel vacations. One of the dubious perks that come with being poor is being used to not taking trips to places or going out a lot. I'm so used to all of it that it's hardly worth a distinction. Being poor and Jewish has limited me 
from being able to be an active member of a synagogue, participating in pricey community activities, and connecting with my peers and fellow Jews. It has quarantined me from the rest of the Jewish community. Thank you, Maria. Um, we're going to move now to Rachel Ezrielov, who's from Eastern Middle School in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I should emphasize, Rachel, this is a work of fiction. We both took fiction and nonfiction and poetry. Yours, you know, is very realistic fiction, but it, it's, it is a story that you wrote. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Okay, Rachel, can you read us a little bit from your story? We were in French together. It was November. No, October. We fell in love in October. Our social circles had no overlap. Mine were the artists, the one who loved writing and pretending to be hippies. Yours was smaller. You knew every one of them from elementary school, and everyone was so tight. You knew each other's secrets and hidden talents and families. I think you were having a loud argument, one that was definitely not in French, about the best Harry Potter movie when I looked over. You weren't involved in the argument. Maybe you hadn't seen the movies yet. That made it all the more fun when you slept over at my house for the first time, and we watched all of them. At the end of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one, you and your sleep-deprived brain looked right at me and said, I like you. And my sleep-deprived brain looked right back and said, I like you too. Thank you, Rachel. And now, once again, let's move to the Western part of the United States. And let's hear from Lainey Schlesinger, who goes to Burlingham and High School in Burlingham. Is Burlingham, is that Bay Area? Is that? Uh, yeah, it's like 10 minutes from SFO. Okay. So it's Bay Area. Okay. Okay. So read us a little bit of the essay that you wrote. I live in the Bay Area, a place we call a liberal bubble. My school teaches the hate you give to our freshman class and held a protest after the 2016 election. The County Pride Center, with a massive rainbow flag hanging from the roof, resides on one of our busiest streets. Local businesses have signs that read, we welcome all people on their windows. We pride ourselves on being an inclusive community and bigots are statistically outliers. But statistics mean nothing when people are afraid. I watched fear sweep my community last October when the now infamous Tree of Life shooting rocked my Jewish community from the other side of the country. 24 hours after we heard the news, I had worked as a religious school art teacher Things obviously felt different. There was a police car in the temple parking lot and a security car at the door who had become a familiar sight. There was a heaviness that loomed around the facility. Teens and adults all understood that American Jewish life was permanently altered. But when one of my fifth grade students asked me what would happen if someone broke into our religious school with a gun, I was shocked and dealt a heavy blow I still haven't recovered from. Thank you. Uh, Josh, can you read us a bit of the essay that you wrote? More than happy to. Um, Thank you. In 1980, a Jewish couple in Minsk makes the bold decision to abandon their livelihoods to pursue a better life. As successful physics professors, they both make a comfortable enough living to raise their two daughters, but their economic status does little to combat the persecution they face. The pursuit of higher jobs is hindered because of their Judaism. Although valedictorian of her high school, their eldest daughter is denied entry to university, for the school's Jewish quota is full. Their youngest daughter has been harassed in school because of her background. In the eyes of a ruthless dictatorship, they are merely second-class citizens. And despite fear of being denied emigration and classified as an enemy of the state, life is no longer tolerable. Risking almost everything to escape, they submit their papers and request to emigrate on January 26th. A little over two months later, on April 8th, the government grants them permission to leave. The Jewish couple from Minsk, my grandparents, crossed the border into Poland on May 4th, my mother's 13th birthday. Thank you, Josh. And let's close out our session of readings with uh, part of a poem. Uh, Victoria submitted a poem. Can you read us a little bit of it? Of course. You, you are the world. You represent all the good worth living for. Happiness, love, kindness, hope, in peace. You show me what it's like to give, to nourish, to treasure. Your smile is the sky, bright and sunny. It gives birth to all who walk. Your nose are the vast oceans, who grow large and vast and never turn down the rain. Your eyes are the stars who walk the sky, who guide us even when we don't know. 
and every little bump or flaw in your skin, those are the people. Would it be different? Would it be different if you never opened up? If I never saw what you hid behind your perfect walls and sunny lands? If I never saw what you really were? If I didn't see your hatred, racism, corruption, every ounce of pain, every tear shed, that was you too. But I forgave you because you were you. Thank you. What I'm noticing from everybody's reading is everybody, in addition to being very strong writers, are very strong readers as well. And I'm wondering on a certain level if those are skills that everyone has managed to develop over the course of three months, two months of, of Zoom classes. And perhaps if we had done this a couple months ago, it would have been a little more perky jerky. But I'm curious, let's, it, you know, I assume because I have daughters who uh, have class on Zoom and everything that everyone's experience is the same, but I don't actually know that. And we have a great, you know, geographical distribution here. We have New York, we have California, Wisconsin, and Maryland. So I would just, let's talk just a little bit about what life is like now and how it's changed in the past couple of months. And maybe it's different in different parts of the country. Julie, do you want to start off and talk a little bit about how, how your experience has changed these past couple of months? Sure. So like most people across the country, my entire life has shifted mostly to an online platform. My school, my synagogue, all of my extra curricular activities, they've all taken on a new existence online. And so I'm, I, I just graduated high school. I, I'm a senior and the fact that the end of my senior year shifted to in an online space, um, it was it was difficult, especially at first, as I began to realize more and more each day that this was not going to be the end of high school the way that I imagined it. But I think that I've also learned that there are there are some benefits to living in a virtual world, at least at least in some ways. Can you tell us what a couple of those benefits might be? Like, what did, what did you, what did you find? Absolutely. So one of the main benefits is that because, because instead of, you know, I live, I live in New York city, so I have to walk to get everywhere basically, or take the subway. So instead of, instead of having to spend time to get between places, it's one click of the computer. And I think it's given me a slightly larger bandwidth of where I can be at what time. I know that I've been able to join extra adult learning classes through my synagogue that otherwise would have happened when I was supposed to be in French class because now, you know, I'm, I can join things between school classes. And also there are, there are some advantages to education being online, of course, you know, in addition to all of the many disadvantages that come with not being able to interact with peers in person. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, ask for some other people's thoughts on that. I'm gonna go a little bit out of the order we went just to switch it up a little bit and also to give us a little geographical distribution. Lainey, can you tell me, do you see advantages, disadvantages of the way you've been going to school? And you can describe if it's your experience is similar to Julie's or if it's different for you. Well, right now, like the geographic differences in my school are immense because when all of this started happening, I was not here in California. I was supposed to be sending a semester abroad in Israel. Um, so within like 48 hours, we were all shipped home. And so the geographic difference is every day I'm taking Hebrew class with someone on the other side of the world. And it's only because of this modern technology that I can do that. So it's one of the great benefits is that I'm able to stay connected with my teachers where other, otherwise wouldn't. And this is true with my friends. Um, we, I have a group of friends, half of us live on the East Coast, half of us live on the West Coast. And I don't think if it, if it wasn't for quarantine and um, the emphasis on connecting digitally, I don't think we would have stayed in as much touch as we have, like FaceTiming every day. Okay, let's, let's, uh, how's, it, how's it going over there in Wisconsin, Josh? Uh, what's, um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you, is, is, how's uh, you know, life in quarantine school for you? Or maybe things have opened up there quicker than I know. How, what, what's the deal in Wisconsin? So uh, my normal day, uh, Monday through Friday, would have consisted of me waking up at 6 a.m., um, probably staying in bed for another 15 minutes, and then leaving the house at 6.40 um, to go on a bus and starting school at 7.20. 
and our school adjusted um, instead of doing individual classes um, from 7:20, etc. Uh, they may have us submit all of our work by three o'clock. So it's given us a lot of uh, freedom in how we want to design our day. How do we want to get our work done? So um, me, the night owl, or being the night owl I am, I stay up a little later and I don't get up at six o'clock, more like eight o'clock. But it's given me a lot of freedom in designing how I want to um, craft my school day, how I want to um, approach my assignments. And teachers have always been are always available through um, email, which is really convenient. Uh, but I'm definitely missing the social element because um, not being able to see my friends every day or even um, some of my some of my peers that I'm not super close with, not being able to see them every day has definitely taken its toll. Do you get to see them at all, like social distance hangouts or not even that? I've tried to do a couple social distance or so, socially distant hangouts. Um, I have a lot of friends that live, um, I live um, between Madison and Milwaukee and I live about 45 minutes from Milwaukee, and I have a lot of friends that live there, so it's not as easy to hang out with them um, socially distant, or do a st socially distant hangout with them as I would uh, normally. Yeah, Rachel, I mean, you're, the story you wrote seems to exist almost in another universe, even though it was only a few months ago, a universe where people could go out to dinner and go to Applebee's and things like that. How's, how has life changed for you? Well, there are a lot of things that I was taking for granted before this happened, things that I thought were basic human rights, like being able to touch someone, being able to stand in a crowded area or eat with people. These are all things that I thought that they weren't privileges, they were rights, but they're not, I'm not free to do these anymore. I never knew that that would ever happen. And now I have to confront that reality. And how is it, I mean, this, if, if this gets too personal for people, feel free to deflect it, right? How is this people, how are people being affected emotionally by this? Is it, are people feeling apathetic? Are people feeling hopeful? The one thing I would say about reading all of your essays is they gave me a great bit of hope and optimism, not because they were necessarily the most upbeat, not all of them were, but just the fact that there were all these people who were taking advantage of their time in quarantine to write something really really lovely was just, you know, put me in a better mood while reading them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you were in a better mood while writing them. Um, Marika, do you, how, how are you affected by what's going on now? Do you, um, do you have any thoughts? Um, well, personally, like so many other kids, obviously, I would see my friends every day and like, I would have no trouble, like, interacting with other people all the time because my school is really big like almost, almost like way overpopulated so people would be how, around how big, is big? How, how big is big it's huge um we have my high school has like an upwards of like 3,500 students wow so yeah <laughs> so like people are always around each other and like always able to talk with other people and like there was no issue with being able to find someone to do something whatever right so seeing other people all the time like I would see my friends every morning like that was a definite like I would see them every morning and then during lunch at the same time every day guaranteed right so not being able to do that anymore has sort of like made me realize how much I like needed that to be able that like regularity to be able to socialize properly and like engage in conversations with regularly with people um because if i'm not constantly practicing that which i haven't been um because of the quarantine like it becomes really hard to put into practice talking with people um so that's been kind of hard for me to try and get used to does it, are there things that you're almost, that this didn't occur to me, so now, are there things that almost you feel like you're forgetting to know how to do, like things that you have to remind yourself that used to be really easy? Um, probably. Okay, it felt <laughs> fair Probably enough. like a lot of things, like, I don't know. Um, I guess like, sounds dumb, but like remembering to eat. <laughs> like sometimes you're just doing something and you like don't think about it because you're just sucked into that one thing and like you know if, if I guess if you're just like really engaged into that 
um, it's easy to just forget about it. And with like the schedule of, you know, guaranteed time and space to do this thing, like you would do it as provided by school and like schedules and stuff. Okay. Victoria, how are, how are you um, handling it? How's your life changed? What do you, what do you think? How's um, well, I was kind of hit pretty hard by quarantine since I was a very social kid. And when it first started, I, of course, missed all my friends. Because one of the things is that we get on video calls a lot. And I'm like two feet away from the camera and I see them, but it hurts because I can't interact with them. But um, there was a part of me that was upset and that said, well, it's not fair. But then there's another part of me that realizes I'm also really privileged to be able to have a computer and Wi-Fi and be able to interact with them. And I realized that's a privilege that not a, lot other, not a lot of other people get. And I realized that I'm lucky and I should take advantage of it while I can. Okay, do you get to go? How, how often do you get to go outside? Do you? Um, there have been, I live in San Francisco and there have been a string of robberies and break-ins and um, my mom will, let, one of my best friends was assaulted and my mom doesn't want me to leave the house. So I usually stay at home. I mean, but with walks with your with your parents when sometimes. Um, I sometimes go out. Um, me and my basketball team sometimes go out to have group workouts. But um, I, I I take runs, but I don't like walking with other people. It's just a personal habit I have. Yeah. Uh, I have anxiety, and it kind of it I get affected when people are too close to me sometimes. Fair enough. Is, out of curiosity, is when you said that there are crimes that have been happening in San Francisco, are is this a, something that has changed recently? Like, is there has something in the environment changed? Are people using everyone being quarantined as an opportunity, or is is this not anything unusual? Is, is something changed out there in California? Um, I don't think it's that unusual. San Francisco, there are a lot of things going on, but um, I think more light is being shed upon it since it's an issue that's happening. And since I think people are taking advantage of the facts that stores are boarded up and there's no one there. And I think that since that's happening, the me there's a lot more attention on the media since there's nothing, there's not a lot else to focus on. But um, I live in a pretty safe neighborhood, for example, and there, one of the stores two blocks down has been broken into that you, I don't think that would have happened ever before quarantine. I think people are branching out. Okay. So I, I also was curious, like, we talk about, actually, Victoria, you've touched on this a little bit on what's been difficult. You've, people have also talked about like what, you know, the advantages of and the privileges that you've experienced while being in this very, very strange and hopefully ultimately short period. What are there, um, can you touch people on what has been the most difficult part? What's been hardest to get used to? And maybe, Lainey, do you want to talk about that? If there's something that you sure. think was really, really difficult in this period? Mm -hmm. I think for me, and it still continues to be a, like issues, at least in the Bay Area, um, things are slowly, but not, they're just slowly returning to normal. And one of the things that I'm finding really difficult is there's no like set day where like two weeks from now, everything's going to be fine. You can go back to normal. It's really like playing it day by day. And like, I struggle, like not having anything necessarily to like look forward to. And it's like, well, no one says when it's like things are going to go back to normal. So who knows? Maybe it's never going to go back to normal. Um, it starts kind of. It starts to feel a little bit hopeless sometimes, just because no one like it's such a big question. Like no one's ever we've never been through this before as a society. And I guess what keeps me going is planning stuff like with friends. Um, I get my partner to drive over twenty minutes away, and we have we sit on opposite sides of the driveway and hang out. Um, my friends FaceTime every day, like just trying to set stuff. So like every, like the days don't blend into each other and feel like this like void of, well, no one says it's going to get better anytime soon. So I just, that's been really difficult, but I'm finding ways to get over it. And Julie, you seem to have a really good attitude about this. You seem very focused and very organized, but are there things that have been particularly difficult for you during this time? For me, the most difficult part of this time has been the lack of closure that I felt in multiple facets of my life. I, I've gone to the same school actually since I was five years old. So this year was my 13th year at the school and many of the students I go to school with I've known 
since I was very, very young. And coming to terms with the fact that I'm not really going to have the chance to say the proper goodbye that I imagined and to say the proper thank yous to a community that means so much to me has been very difficult. And I know that the girls with whom I'm very close friends all I'll keep seeing and I'll keep in touch with, but there are also people in the community that I really enjoy spending time with, but that I'm not necessarily in super close touch with. And it's, it's just sad to think about the fact that I'll never really get to say a proper goodbye to them. Rachel, do you have thoughts on something that's been really, really tough for you during this time? Um, well, I think, you know, a couple things. I haven't been able to see any of my friends, um, which has been really hard. I've been trying to connect with them, but some of them, you know, don't have access to the same things that I do, trying to connect with them online. And some of them, I go to a magnet school where people live all over the county. So it's really, really hard to be able to set up, you know, hangouts. I haven't had any of those because none of them live near me. It's really hard to do that. Marika, anything you would like to add to that, uh, what Rachel just said and what uh, other people have been talking about? What do you mean specifically? I mean, sure I like, tell me, tell me that, is, is there been anything that's been specifically really difficult during this period? I mean, I, I, we all try and make the best of it and we're all coping with this new reality that we have, but is there something that's been really hard? Um, I guess just trying to learn in my really challenging classes um, because, you know, like um, some t the, I don't know, like <laughs> we, our school like took like two or three weeks to try and get online because we hadn't, for some reason, hadn't been as prepared for, um, what we need to do, you know, they need to like pass out Chromebooks to all the students who like didn't have computers at home for themselves. Um, and like the, our teachers sort of had like a limited amount of resources and there was like constant confusion. And, um, you know, it was really hard for me to try and learn and complete assignments based on the information that I was struggling with um, and still still am struggling with um, when there's like a limited amount of resources and like a limited amount of time to be able to get it done. And I understand it's also hard that like my friends don't understand it as well because ordinarily I would go to them to help like work with them to get through it but they're also having trouble, like the same problem as me almost. So it's like, where do I turn to sort of, and there's only so much like that's being provided. So I have to like look out for it for myself. And like, when I understand something, I have to help my friends. So it's like trying to find everything for myself. So that's been really hard. <laughs> Josh, you spoke a little bit about the difficulty of um, not being able to see friends and even people you don't aren't necessarily close with, but being able to see them. Is there anything else that's been difficult during this period? I think one of my biggest issues is trying to craft a daily schedule and um, use it to keep myself motivated because uh, I'm not the best with time management and in an everyday set in an everyday setting, I'd be waking up at six o'clock. I'd have my um, classes, extracurriculars, homework, and it was a lot more structured and now I'm the person who's creating literally everything for how I'm going to structure my day. And that's been difficult. And it leaves me with um, a reminder of even the little things I need to remember to do, um, like changing in the morning. Um, I'm the person who would um, stay in PJs throughout the entire day. And um, it's been difficult to make sure that I can craft a schedule, stay motivated and try to make the most of it. Because um, even though we, are kind of expected to live vicariously through Zoom. Uh, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of trying to adjust my life online and um, try to um, make the most of a schedule um, through the internet. Yeah, um, that leads me to something else that I'm gonna start with Rachel to um, ask about and I'll ask everyone about it. At some point this is going to 
and you're going to go back to school. Julie, you're not going to go back to the same school, but you will be, you know, somewhere else. Is there anything you're going to miss about this way of learning? Is there anything that, or will you just be happy not to see faces on screens ever again? Not that that's really going to happen, but um, Rachel, do you, do you, anything you're going to miss about this period? I'm really going to miss not having to wake up at 6 a.m. every morning. Um, I go to a school that's, you know, a little further away from my house, and I'm so glad that I have finally been able to get enough sleep, and it's really hard to think that, you know, in a few months, you know, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, yes, I will have to wake up at 6 a.m. because I do want to go back to school, but I also, I think I've been actually learning a lot better when I've had a lot more sleep. Victoria, anything you're going to miss about uh, the strange world that we've entered? Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to really miss anything. Um, I do like being able, like people have said, to wake up late. But um, I think in a couple months or a couple years, I'll be able to look back on this and not miss it, but to think, I think I gained perspective in this experience. And I realized that like the, thing, the little things that we take for granted, seeing our friends and everything like that, and I'm going to look back and I'm going to think, I need to treasure this while I can. Lainey, any thoughts of something you're going to miss from uh, this period in history and your personal history? Yeah, I mean, I think me, like a lot of other people right now, I've taken this excuse to like learn new school skills, especially baking and like cooking. And so I've been baking and cooking a lot more and I've been really enjoying it. And so I think I'm going to miss like not be able to like make myself lunch most days instead of just like shoving something into my backpack and heading off to school um, or like deciding today I will make bread and just making bread because I don't have like stuff to do besides school. And so I think I'm gonna miss like that chance to like expand my creative freedom and learn new things. And uh, kind of like people are taking this as an opportunity to do things I always wanted to do. And I'm gonna miss when like everything like goes back to normal, whatever nor new normal we have and where people feel like they have to like get back in some sort of cycle and instead of like branching out and trying new things. What kind of bread do you make? Um, so I, I made challah with my mom once or twice. Um, I, I made, me, me and my sister for a while had a tradition of around like 4 p.m. when you're really bored, you go downstairs and make some cookies. And so there's been a lot of like chocolate chip chocolate chip with walnuts, just regular chocolate chip. Like I tried making rainbow cookies a couple of weeks ago and those are pretty cool. And so just kind of like doing whatever, you know, you kind of can't get much at the grocery store, you go to work with what you have. And so it's been a fun kind of chance to explore. Is, is Lainey alone there or does ever, has everyone learned like a new thing, a new skill during this period? Julie, did you, has there been something that you learned that you wouldn't have otherwise done during this period? So I've actually been learning Hebrew on Duolingo, which has been very fun. I have a nice, like, almost 90-day streak on Duolingo now from, from all of quarantine. And hopefully that will give me a little bit of a head start on learning Hebrew during college. But similar to Lainey, my family has been doing a lot of cooking. I'm the oldest of four children, and with my siblings, we alternate making dinner most of our dinners have turned out quite successfully. Some have not, but it's been it's been a good chance to, you know, brush up on those cooking and baking skills. Marika, have you been learning any baking or anything else? Maybe not baking. Maybe language. Maybe nothing at all. Is there something new that you're learning? Um, I actually sort of started to do more baking as well. Um, I always enjoyed it before, but I hadn't always had like the proper time and space to do it because you know I would come home from school and then immediately start my homework and then I might be doing my homework until dinner so it was like I never got enough time I feel like to be able to bake and do things that I never really thought that I actually enjoyed um and so I've been like baking I don't know I made these like St. Patrick's Day mint um <laughs> cookies and um, like this cake, like we made, I made um, one cake from scratch and then one from like cake mix and they were both fine. 
Um, <laughs> I'm not necessarily good at baking, but um, I do realize like how much I've been able to enjoy it. Um, so I'll definitely like miss the time and space to be able to do things like that, like things I didn't realize I completely enjoyed. And Josh, how's, how's the baking going in Wisconsin? Are you doing some baking? Are you doing something unusual? Um, I don't think I've uh, really gained a new skill throughout this time. I think um, a lot of um, what I'm trying to do is salvage the um, social life that I can't have anymore. So um, like like Victoria said, I'll spend hours upon hours on uh, FaceTime trying to keep up with my friends and make sure that those bonds, are, that those bonds um, remain strong because um, I'm one of those type of, types of people where if you're out of sight, you're often out of mind. And it's extremely important to make sure that those bonds um, stay as strong as they were um, prior to quarantine. So after the quarantine, we can um, uh, return to that type of normalcy because I know that even after um, we return to normal life, it's not gonna be normal. Thank you. And Victoria, uh, any skills? Are you writing a lot more poetry now uh, during this period or doing other things that are different than for what you usually do? Um, I've been doing some more creative writing. I love writing poetry, but uh, like Julie, I have been on Duolingo and I've been trying to learn German. Uh, I was supposed to take um, a two month leave to Germany with my au pair this summer, but that didn't happen. So I'm taking the time to like try and learn German. How's it going? Um, I think I'm doing fine. I'm kind of worried about my accent. I don't, I don't want to walk in and be that person with like the wrong tones. Okay. Uh, Rachel, have you taught yourself a new skill that we should know about? I, I hate to jump on the bandwagon, but yes, I have been baking. But to be fair, I had already started a project before, like, we were even out of school, exploring, like, I was building a website, um, exploring the different cultures behind desserts all over the world. So I just decided, you know, as long as I have all this free time, I'm just going to make all of the desserts. And also another skill that I've tried to learn and failed at is I tried to learn HTML coding to help with my website. And I did that for a little while, but I never really got the hang of it. What kind of website do you have? Um, it's a website. Have... It's, we it's got have... okay. articles and things like that. Things okay. of that nature. Okay. Um, I'm curious, one other thing that crossed my mind that I'm interested in, and I don't want to ask necessarily the what do you want to do in 10 years question, but I'm wondering what everyone thought they might want to do with their lives and if that's changed at all over the past few months or if you have the same basic idea that you always knew exactly what you wanted to do or you still have no idea. Um, let's start with Lainey. Did you have something you wanted to be and that's changed or you still want to? I think if anything this experience has amplified what I want to do. I'm interested in working in the mental health field, specifically in art therapy as like a long term. And I think if anything, like the, like this whole experience is going to have some sort of impact on um, the next generation and how we grow up and interact and how we interact with ourselves and our emotional health. And so it's kind of, it's interesting to see like what's going to start coming up in the next several years, especially as I like go off to college and hopefully grad school. Um, and what sort of impact mental health is going to play in the future for all who for like an entire world that has gone through this together and especially youth and children and young adults who their minds are still developing like what sort of like not necessarily problems but what's going to happen to like these people who have truly experienced something life-changing extraordinary and terrifying and like obviously I think that mental health and mental well-being is going to play a huge role because the trauma that's going to come from this is going to be extraordinary and like terrifying and really like beyond what we can imagine. And so I'm kind of like, I feel lucky. Like I feel very lucky that the field of mental health is probably going to something that's going to continue exp to expand. Um, and whereas like, I think other like industries, especially like people who go to desk jobs, like we've seen that, that, that doesn't need to happen. So it's interesting, like, I hope that I'll be part of, like, a growing world that starts 
that continues to put an emphasis on mental health and emotional well-being, especially after all this. Sounds noble and appropriate, and I wish you luck with that. Um, Julie, um, you got a major planned out? Is it different from the major that you thought it was going to be, or what, what's, what do you think? So I'm not completely decided on a major yet. I know that in, in college, I want to study biology and Judaic studies and perhaps journalism in whatever combination that ends up taking on to be decided. But I think if nothing else, this, these past three or so months have reinforced for me how important it is to find communities and to be a leader in facilitating and creating communities. So I know that wherever I end up career-wise, I do want to, I do want to hold that value close and to make sure that, to make sure that wherever I find myself, I am helping to create community. Marika, do you have a vision for your future? Is it, has it always been the same vision? Is it different now? Um, so more long-term future. Um, I am sort of on the path of like law and advocacy and like public policy and that kind of thing. So that's pretty much stayed consistent throughout the whole like time. Um, but my more immediate future, like say summer, um, has changed. Um, like I think my more immediate future will be filled with activism and trying to work in support of the like for example like the black lives matter movement or mm -hmm. like pride or something um as best as i can and like my my summer plans were um canceled so i originally had a program that i would i would have been attending for the national student leadership council hosted by mm -hmm. yale um but I, it was canceled, so I'll be distance learning for different um, like topics and subjects, probably pertaining to law and public policy and stuff like that, and um, participating in a specifically public policy class from the ACLU. So that's okay. how it's going to be for me. Okay. Uh, Victoria, um, you're going to write and have your work translated into German, something like that? Or um, do you have other visions for yourself? Um, I just turned 13. I haven't actually thought that much about my future um, past college in my career, but I think right now I'm focusing, I'm going into eighth grade, I'm focusing on getting into the high schools I want to. And since I know that this is a time where like education is stalled, so I'm taking this time uh, to try and focus on my academics and excel. Okay, no one's going to hold you to what you say here, so it's okay. So, uh, Rachel, do you have uh, visions for the future that you would like to share? Not really. I'm still confused. I'm still thinking. I hope maybe to do something in the humanities, but there are certainly a few more years where I can learn more about myself and what I'm interested in, what I'm good at, I really want to take the time before I make any, you know, announcements. Okay. Josh, you got an announcement for us? Um, so I attend uh, a public charter school with a focus on health sciences. And that, or that kind of explains my interest in the medical field. And for the longest time, I was really interested in health sciences. And actually right now I'm supposed to take a CNA course through my school. But uh, uh, what, what kind of a course? A CNA course, uh, Certified Nursing Assistant. I see. Mm -hmm. But throughout this quarantine, or obviously quarantine canceled that. And I think with this political atmosphere that we're witnessing, um, it's really, I've always had an interest for politics, but it's definitely strengthened my interest in um, government and law. And especially after um, the recent murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, it's really shown my passion, or it's really given me insight on the importance of um, govern, or government and law in making sure that we can um, attain equality. But um, I touched on this a little bit in my essay. Equality can um, be achieved just through um, dismantling systems. Um, a lot of anti-Semitism that we see in America isn't through um, necessarily um, institutions that are oppressing us, but rather a social culture that permits it. And 
I want to make sure that whatever I do in my future, it pertains to um, leading the way towards equality and making sure that we can dismantle hate both in our social culture and um, through our government. I'm not going to call on people for this, but uh, Josh raises a point, and if someone has something to say on it, uh, raise your hand. Are there people uh, that are there people here who have become more politically minded through this? Has this kind of energized anyone politically the situation? Well, okay, perhaps not, but or perhaps people felt political all along. Julie, it looked like you were about to say something. I, I don't. I don't know if I've necessarily become more politically minded, but I think that the the recent the recent murders and racism that that we've witnessed it's just it's just emphasized the importance to me of having sincere conversations with everyone in my network with family with friends with with mentors and and you know I want to try to do my part, especially as someone who experiences white privilege on a day-to-day -day basis to help to, to help to dismantle the systemic racism that our country faces. Thank you for that. Um, I, I just wanna, uh, we don't have too much more time. I just wanna end on a little bit of perhaps a hopeful note, perhaps. Uh, I want you to think about and tell me you know, at some point, as I said, we'll, we'll look back on this period and it'll be a traumatic period, but we'll learn a lot from it, assuming we all make it well through it. And what is the one thing that you, like, once this is over, that you would really like to do? What are you looking forward to doing that you can't do right now? And I'll, I'll start with Lainey. Is there something that you're looking forward to doing that you can't do right now? Um, I mean, I think, like, a lot of stuff got canceled this summer and especially I was really like I live right near San Francisco I was really looking forward to attending pride with my partner at the end of the month but that can't happen so I'm just like getting really excited for like next year and all the things that couldn't happen this year but they're gonna be so much better when it can happen again and like I don't really know like I know for sure that like I'm really tired of the six foot difference because that's really diff difficult to maintain in a relationship but also like I'm excited for like just to experience things again and like go to places and like go on adventures and I'm really excited to do that in whatever shape it's going to take. Victoria, is there something you're looking forward to doing? Um, I think I'll be looking for the well, the first thing I'll be doing once I get out of quarantine is I'll run up to my friends and I'll give them a giant hug since I really miss them. But I think after that, I think I'm going to be looking forward to experiencing all the activities and things I would have I would have missed. I know there won't be like a graduation, but I, I think it'll be fun to interact and do all the activities that I miss. Like I was taking a virtual camp and I'm sure next year I'll be able to actually visit it. Rachel, something you're looking forward to? I guess my ambitions, they don't, they don't sound as large, but I really wanna go on a picnic. I mean, the weather is great. I just want to call up one of my friends and say, let's eat outside and be able to, you know, touch them, you know, and share food and stuff. I mean, it doesn't sound crazy, but it's impossible. Marika, something you're looking forward to? Um, sort of like Rachel, my, I really, really want to hang out with my friends. But for some reason, especially, I've been really missing going to the pool. Um, <laughs> as dumb as it sounds, um, like just being able to decide that you're going to go to the pool that day and then like you can grab a pizza and then just go to the pool and spend all day getting in and out and doing various different things, Talk like hanging out with your friends in the pool or like doing, playing volleyball or whatever you wanted to do and being able to just like, that would be your one like set thing for the day. <laughs> And then um, when you're ready to go home, you're like tired, you're probably a little bit sunburned if you're like me. Um, <laughs> and you like get a good night's sleep after that because you're so tired, you've been like exercising all day. And I just, I really miss that for some reason. Um, so I'll be looking forward to doing that and hanging out with my friends in like whenever that 
will be able to happen. Josh, is there something you're looking forward to? So Julie touched on this a little bit, but quarantine has definitely shown the importance of community to me. And one of my biggest communities is my youth group, BBYO. So as soon as all of this is done, I'm extremely excited to go to a BBYO program or convention because I really miss seeing all my friends and being able to come together because um, the BBYO community for me is extremely important and it's really been difficult to um, try to continue with our programs uh, via Zoom. Thank you for the shout out to BBYO, one of our co-sponsors along with the Jewish Education Project. And Julie, you uh, wrap up telling something that you're looking forward to doing once this is all over, whatever over even means. I think I'm most looking forward to doing two different things. First of all, I'm looking forward to taking walks with friends and actually having a destination. Recently in, in, the, rare, in the rare chance that I do get to take a walk it's not like there's actually anywhere to go. So the end destination of the walk is the same as the starting destination. And the other thing that I'm looking forward to, and you know, it may be a pretty long wait before this happens, but I'm looking forward to Kabbalat Shabbat on Friday night at synagogue. I go to a pretty large synagogue called Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City. So I'm assuming it's going to be a slightly long time before the community is actually able to gather together safely for Shabbat services. But Kabbalat Shabbat is always a highlight of the week for me and I'm really looking forward to that moment of community gathering again. Thank you. And I think that's where we will end our conversation. I think anyone who is watching this now or will watch it on YouTube later can see from how articulate and hopeful all of you are why you are among the winners of our Young Writers Contest. I want to thank all of you so much for participating and for being coming here prepared, reading for us, and giving such kind, thoughtful responses. Uh, thanks to our judges and the Jewish Education Project and BBYO. And above all, thanks to everyone who contributed to this conversation. And thank you to everyone who wrote such wonderful essays. I hope everybody reads them online. And Thank you so much for joining. I wish you all the best of luck with your future and hope this will be a time capsule that will tell us what it was like this time in 2020. Thanks so much. Have a good rest of your day.